Shalom. Um, I was reading in Leviticus this morning. I'm going through Leviticus again in my morning Bible reading. And I read chapter 12 this morning, um, along with some other chapters. But in chapter 12, it is talking about the purification after childbirth. So when you read this chapter, you find that after a woman uh, carries a baby in her womb for for about 40 weeks, that if she births forth a male child, that she is unclean for seven days, just like in her menstrual impurity. Um, it says that on the eighth day, the little boy is to be circumcised, and then she continues, meaning continues is a reference back to those initial seven days, so that process continues um, in her purification from bleeding for another 33 days. So there's a total of 40 days that a woman is is unclean, not unclean in the sense of um, uh, under the punishment of Yahweh, um, but uh, unclean in the sense of ritually unclean, um, not allowed to go to the tabernacle or touch something that is set apart or have sexual relations with her husband during this time period. And then it doubles when a woman bears forth a female child. It's an 80-day period rather than a 40-day period. And Yahweh's protecting the the woman here. Uh, the woman needs time to heal. Um, I'm a father of five children, so I've been present at the birth of all five of my, my children. And uh, even physicians today will tell you that when a woman goes through pregnancy and then she delivers the child, that it takes uh, a period of at least around 40 days or six weeks for her to heal and for all of the pieces of the puzzle inside of her to go back into their proper position in their proper place. And so she needs time to heal. So Yahweh's law way back then was recognizing something that modern day science recognizes now. He knew way back then that a woman needs time to heal after she is pregnant with and delivers either a male or female child. Uh, so, yes, people say, um, is, is Yahweh's law still for us today? Well, why would a law like this not be for us today? I know we don't have a tabernacle, so a woman's not concerned with specifically going to the tabernacle and the church house or the synagogue is not equivalent, one-to-one -one equivalent, with the Old Testament tabernacle or temple. But why would this, this law about the healing process for a, a woman and the abstinence from sexual relations, why would that be done away with? What, why would we want to do away with that? A woman still goes through all of those things, and it's protection for her, as all of Yahweh's law are. They're help, they're help to our navel, marrow to our bones, so forth and so on. Um, that's just a little backdrop, three minutes worth <laughs> of backdrop of what I wanted to actually talk about and that is how, in this, we learn that the law of Yahweh is not burdensome. Now, a lot of times when you talk about the law, people say, oh, that Old Testament law, that law of Moses, primitive, archaic, outdated, we live on this side of the cross now. And they say all these things, and they say it was you know, such a burden. It's like the Lord had them pushed down under his big spiritual thumb, and everybody is just all burdened down by this Oh, terrible law and this fearsome creator and, and, and all of that. So you know, it comes with dispensational theology and, and, and thinking. Um, but in this law, we learn not just how Yahweh has care for the female, but how that he does not overburden the poor. And the reason we know this is that at the end of this law, in Leviticus chapter 12, verse 7, um, or excuse me, verse 6, when her days of purification are complete, whether for a son or daughter, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old male lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. Uh, the sin offering there is kata'at in Hebrew, and it can also be purification offering. It doesn't have to mean that the person has committed a transgression. It can be for purification, ritual purification. So the woman didn't sin by having the baby. But she had to be ritually purified because she went through a, a, a natural trauma in her body whereby she bled out 
much and she had to be purified and there was an offering for that purification. Um, verse 7, he will present them before Yahweh, that is the priest, uh, and make atonement on her behalf. She will be clean from her discharge of blood. This is the law for a woman giving birth, whether to a male or a female. And in verse 8, but if she does not have sufficient means for a sheep, she may take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. Then the priest will make atonement on her behalf and she will be clean. The law of Yahweh here allowed that if there was a female or a family that was poor and didn't have the means or couldn't afford the year old male lamb for the burnt offering, that you could just bring the two turtle doves or two young pigeons, which were less expensive to buy or to raise, and offer one of them up for a burnt offering and the other one for a kata'at, a purification offering. Yahweh was looking out for the poor people in his law. Looking back a few pages to Leviticus chapter 5, we find something similar. In Leviticus chapter 5, verses 5 through 12, I won't read it all, but you can read the whole chapter of Leviticus 5, and it's talking about how that somebody is guilty in a sin. And it talks about bringing a restitution offering. And at the beginning, it talks about, in verse 6, it's a female lamb or a goat from the flock as a sin offering. But in verse 7, it says, but if you can't afford an animal from the flock, he can bring to Yahweh two turtle doves or two young pigeons as restitution for his sin. One as a sin offering, the other as a burnt offering. And then if that doesn't go far enough, if, let's show even less of a burden. Verse 11, same chapter, but if he cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, he may bring two quarts of fine flour as an offering for his sin. He must not put olive oil or frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. So even for the poorest of the poor that couldn't afford the two young pigeons or the two turtle doves, you can bring two quarts of fine flour. How, how is this a burden? See, Yahweh's law is liberty, and he looks out for the poor. It's not a burden at all. His commandments are not burdensome. So last but certainly not least, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 shows us that young Miriam known as often as the Virgin Mary, after she had Yeshua. It says in verse 22, And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, and what, what is the purification talking about? Leviticus chapter 12, we just read. Their purification, some people balk at this rendering because some Bibles say her purification. Uh, their probably includes Yeshua. Not that he had to be purified from sin, but that he went through the birth canal and he was birthed because he was a human being and there had to be ritual purification. See, So when, when it was through, according to the law of Moses, they brought him and the day there is, is Miriam and Joseph, Mary and Joseph. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, to present him to Yahweh. They presented Yeshua to Yahweh. Just as it is written in the law of Yahweh, every firstborn male will be dedicated to Yahweh, verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of Yahweh, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, Leviticus 12, verse 8. They offered up the two turtle doves or the two pigeons here because Yosef and Miriam were poor. They didn't have sufficient means to bring the animal the four-legged animal that would cost more to buy or to raise. So they brought the cheaper sacrifice. And Yahweh allowed it and Yahweh received it because the person didn't have means for the other. Do you hear again? In the law of Yahweh, we learn that Yahweh looks out for the poor and the law does not burden down the insignificant or the poor person. Yahweh bless his word to your heart today.